All right. So when I first decided to come up with the topic for this, I looked immediately at what I was passionate about, and that being physics. And as I looked into the history of physics, I realized that it had a very important and compelling story to tell, specifically in the founding of quantum physics. So I know that quantum physics can be a pretty daunting topic to understand, and that's also largely because it's difficult to explain. So let's start where we all sort of know quantum physics, whether we realize it or not, through the technology. So quantum physics has been responsible for developing technology that define our current day society. Uh, materials like the transistor and lasers make up a lot of our computers, technology, and, and um, internet. And all those things are vital to the way we now do society. So we also now need to understand that the way that physics has developed over time is largely due to people making jar large shifts in, in perspective. So if you were to ask me what my favorite and probably the most telling quote in all of physics is, it would be this one, attributed to Albert A. Mickelson in the year 1894. What he essentially says is that at that time he said, all the fundamental laws in physics have already been discovered and there's essentially nothing else to learn. Now, he said this six years before the advent of the quantum revolution, of a field that still remains at the forefront of contemporary physics today. And this was a common sentiment uh, to the point where Max Planck, the person who eventually founded quantum physics and led this new revolution, was told by his university professor not to pursue physics because there's, they, the common sentiment at the time was not that there was nothing else to discover. But luckily for us, he ignored his professor and went on to discover quantum physics, and it's responsible for all the technology we have right now that have brought us here together today. So let's, it also, quantum physics also has a deep philosophical implication, but that's somewhat difficult to grasp now, because they, Quantum physics seems to operate at scales super large or super small, things that we can't really touch or that don't really seem to affect us. So let's try using an analogy right now. Uh, let's look at 1600s. And in the 1600s, for over one and a half millennia, people had thought that the Earth lied at the center of the universe and everything else orbited around it. And this is Ptolemy's uh, geocentric model of the universe. H however, as the decades passed, new ideas began to surface and suddenly Nicholas Copernicus came up with this heliocentric model of the universe, which was supported by scientific evidence. And in this, the sun lies at the center and everything else rotates around us. Now this might be obvious to us now, but you know, if you're back in the 1600s, you looked up at the sky, you saw the sun, the moon, and everything, it's kind of hard to figure out where everything is in relation to one another. So over time, as this idea became adopted, there surely must have been an existential shift in thought, right? Because now suddenly you come from being the center of the universe with everything else revolving around you to just a speck on a planet among many orbiting the sun. And now that's somewhat fairly easy to understand because you can see all that stuff. But in quantum mechanics, you can't see anything. You can't see the effects. It goes from model, quantum mechanics can model things from carbon atoms to galaxies, but we can't really see what that means to our daily lives. So I think it's now it's time to address a major question. What is quantum physics? Now, that's very hard to explain because it lies at uh, the stretches of existence where we can't really inhabit. But luckily for us, technology is progressing in a way that quantum physics, the philosophy of quantum physics is being ingrained in it. And technology has advanced to a point where they have to shift the way they make technology and the philosophy behind it. So let's go to a field we all know and love and that inter we interact with every day, computing. So let's talk about quantum computing, an up and coming phenomenon. Well, computers are already quantum beings because they have transistors in them and transistors are based off quantum mechanic discoveries. But what's the difference with quantum computing? Well, to address that, we first need to look at how conventional computing works. So information in conventional computing is encoded in binary. So in binary, you have two main states of information, zero and one, which represents on or off on a transistor. And you know this is fairly easy to understand. You have two different states, and when combined in different combinations, you can, you can make meaning in different ways. Now, in Intel co-founder Gordon Moore, when, this, when transistors were still first becoming big things and computers were being invented and created, he made something called Moore's Law by looking at the trends. 
So he said that one, one, uh, one or two years, every one or two years, the amount of transistors you can fit in a single area will double, meaning the transistors are going to have in size. And this increases the power dramatically. However, in recent years, we've been seeing that this begins to fall off. We're no longer doubling it every one or two years. Now, why is that? That's because in computing, they're reaching a conceptual barrier. And that conceptual barrier happens as transistors get smaller and smaller until they get to the atomic scale. And at that scale, classical physics begins to break down and quantum physics begins to start occurring. So that means you need to fundamentally change the way we look at information and the way we encode information. So we have the classical bit, the zero and the one. We're familiar with that. Now we have to contend with the qubit. Now the qubit is the quantum bit. And there's an idea in quantum mechanics that probabilities are, are very much real and they very much affect the way things work. So now, instead of the normal bit where you have on or off, you have on, off, and something in between, everything else in between. All those probabilities are real and they affect the way these functions. So now you essentially have three states, on, off, and everything in between. And this dramatically increases computing power. Now, the cool thing about this is I didn't really explain quantum physics to you. I explained quantum computing. But now that computing has reached a point where physics and uh, the physics has begun to change, um, now they have to change the way they basically set everything up and organize it. And you might be asking, if computers are going to get a lot more powerful, what about my safety? What about my information? Hackers can easily get access to our stuff right now. But what about when they have quantum computers? Well, quantum physics can apply to a variety of fields in the future. So we have quantum cryptography coming up. So what's cryptography? Normal cryptography is essentially a way to encode information to deny access to all those who don't have the key. So you know, when you have the key, you input the key, you send it off through the internet to the server, and that server will read that key and say, yep, that's the correct key. I'll let you in. But what can happen is an eavesdropper can sort of pick the key out of, the, out of transition and look at it and say, oh, that's what the key is, and then just release it again. And now they have your password, and they can access everything you have. So that's not very desirable. But quantum physics, when applied to quantum cryptography, can fix that. So you see, there's an idea in quantum physics called the observer effect. When you look at something in quantum physics, when you look at a quantum object, the act of looking at it changes the nature of the thing itself. So in this case, you're sending your key out. If someone looks at the key along the way, it changes the nature of that key, basically changing up the key. And when it gets received by the recipient, they now know that the key was changed. And they can be like, oh, someone's looking in on us. Let's not let that person in. Let's reset your password. So that's how quantum physics is going to get into every single aspect of our technological uh, future. And when that happens, quantum physics, that revolution, that paradigm shift, no longer just applies to the realm of physics, but now it's starting to apply to our own lives in really real ways. And as the philosophy gets picked up, we can understand quantum physics better. And imagine, all of this, everything I just talked about, was a result of one man, Max Planck, shifting his perspective on an idea that's been so long held in physics. And, and physics at the time, remember, was, a, was considered a dying field. And he said, no, I'm looking at this in a different way. And he revolutionized our lives. And hopefully, in the future, we can look forward to cool new quantum technology. Thank you.